A special dedication for Ambush Yamumo Chamrock Records, right? La Calada present, si! A puff wit! Yamu Yamo! Dabba Dab Sound from Abruzzo! Yamumo, Yamumo! So, hi everyone, my name is Colin Bell. I'm the co-founder and chief growth officer for a company in Estados Unidos called Grosentia. Uh, a lot of people know us by our brand name, Mammoth Microbes. I also am a research scientist from Colorado State University. I have a PhD in soil microbiology, and my academic speciality was focused on understanding plant microbe interactions. And so I actually made this first product, Mammoth P, at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. We tested it on a lot of plants, in Colorado, also cannabis, a lot. <laughs> it worked so well that I left the university actually the three years from tomorrow to start the company. Yeah, so that's our background. Since then, uh, scaled the team in Colorado. We're still in Fort Collins, Colorado. We have 50 employees. We're selling in over 800 retail stores, hydro shops in the US. 100 shops in UK we just launched. We're launching with our distributor partners, Plantasur, in Spain. We're doing a great job. Nico's here. Uh, he's been doing a great job. And we've also expanded through South America, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, and Argentina. And it's all about bringing microbes and natural processes back to agriculture. So that's our mission statement, bringing nature back to agriculture and harnessing the power of microbes to help plants grow naturally. Wow, very nice. Which kind of difference you, you see in each country yes. about these things, about uh, fairs, events, clubs, how, how is used the, the, the wheat in different countries like America, Canada? That's a really fun question. <laughs> and the, the short answer is it's different everywhere. Even in the United States, it's different in every state. And so everywhere it's legalized, we have a different environment. In Chile, it's very different. In Colombia, it's very different than Uruguay. In the United Kingdom, it's very different. Spain, and so every country has its unique idiosyncrasies. For example, UK, United Kingdom. Pretty much illegal. Black market. But there's a lot of growing. And so there's a lot of people they grow cannabis in their homes. There's a lot of medium-sized grows, 50, maybe 100 light grows, that are, we call them gorilla grows, meaning they're, you know, you know what that means. And there are also, interestingly enough, a lot of clubs similar to the clubs in Spain that aren't necessarily legal, but they're overlooked. Where they're private clubs, you can go there, you can't find, you have to know someone to get in the club, we're familiar with that, but they are emerging. And so I'm going to go do some tours of some of these clubs uh, in the UK. One indication of the amount of growing in different countries is the amount of hydro grow shops. In the UK, there's 400 grow shops in a pretty small country. They're very big grow shops. In Spain, there's about 1,200 grow shops. And we, we understand Spain. The audience uh, watching this probably understands Spain. In Chile, there's 1,200 grow shops. In Colombia, there's very few grow shops, and the economics are different, but anyone can grow 20 plants as a citizen of Colombia. And interestingly enough, in Colombia, I'm just telling some highlights of my, this is a, long, a big topic. Yeah. Uh, the government in Colombia is actually positioning themselves to be the first international exporter of all cannabis-related products. They're issuing government licenses for large-scale commercial marijuana cultivation, large-scale hemp cultivation, national extraction on large-scale, and national exportation licenses. What they want to do, and they learn from coffee, is they want to control the process to the final high value product so they can export it. And they're positioning themselves to do that. And they are going to be huge. 
the cool example about Columbia is the whole country has a light of about 12 hours on and about 12 hours off, naturally. And so the whole country is like a natural bloomer. Yes. And so they're understanding how to spotlight fields to extend the vegetative cycle and turning those off and blooming them. There's, it's early days, but that's very exciting. Uruguay is another really exciting example where there's government regulated fields that they actually process and sell in pharmacies. There's also private clubs where club owners can grow their own product mm -hmm. and sell and individuals can grow. So again, there's so many different examples. I think the overarching uh, message is that cannabis is becoming more legitimate as a crop that people enjoy, that they should be able to use recreationally, that they have the right to use medicinally, and that's a plant that should be allowed. And even more and more, we find states realizing that the prohibition on cannabis, and I truly believe this is a mistake. And slowly but surely, governments are realizing that there's a lot more value and a lot more good than harm by allowing people to express their rights, their majority right, to grow this plant and enjoy this plant and to use this plant for their needs. Cool. And in more the um, in more a commercial market like the big trips like Emerald Cup in America or Spanavis here. Yes. How it's the, the big difference for you? I think there's a huge difference between let's just compare uh, let's compare the MJ Biz Conference, the MJ Business Conference in Las Vegas. That's the biggest conference of the year in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Spanibus, I would consider, I've been to many shows, the, probably the biggest single trade show conference in Europe. The first time I went to Spanibus was last March, a year ago. And I'd really never been to, I've never been to Spain before. And it's very confusing to me because I didn't understand all the genetics companies, because all the shows in the U.S., no genetics companies, all nutrient companies, and additive companies, and lighting companies, and pot companies, and all these infrastructure and greenhouse companies. So there's a lot of cultivation, but the genetics wasn't really apparent. There's obviously genetics available only online. Then you go over to Spanibus, and a third of the show is genetics companies. And I was walking around from booth to booth last year, understanding, can you help me understand this? I don't understand this. And then, you know, just discovery like anyone else. You don't know what you don't know until you talk to people. I'm a scientist. I'm a PhD scientist. But I'm also a humble student. And I realize that I don't know way more than I know. But how I learn today, as in before, is I'll talk to people. And so I started slowly understanding how Europe in particular, and South America also, it's very different from the United States. The United States is focused on inputs and larger scale cultivation, where I think in Europe, particularly, there's a lot more boutique and smaller growers just inherently through the infrastructure and people's interest of wanting to grow, but having more limitations uh, as far as even space limitations. And so the genetics have become really popular. And autoflower, I didn't understand it. I mean, you don't buy auto flowers in the U.S. You buy plants and you grow them. And in Colorado, where I'm from, and where I live now, you can grow 12 plants. And so I'd have a bloom room, and I'd have a bedroom, and I would just grow big plants, you know? And it's a plant count, it's not a size. And so you could grow big trees if you want to. And so it, it's, it's really funny, it's changed a lot. And I guess the third contrasting example is South America. And there's different economies that you have to consider in all these markets. The seed market and genetics market is huge in South America, but the inputs market is really small. A lot of people, Colombia, I'll use this example, have been growing and it's in their heritage. They grow flowers, for example, one of the number one producers of flowers across the world. And they still use organics because their grandma's grandma's grandma has shown them how to harness organic material, uh, chicken scratch, whatever's on the farm to build soil. And so it's fascinating how even in Europe and especially in South America, Sudamerica, 
there's a huge focus on natural. There's a really big focus on organic. And in the United States, people are just now starting to understand, wow, Okay. We don't need synthetics now. Let's start growing more organic. And they understand why, because they actually see and experience the taste and quality difference. And they're starting to really understand, finally, how chemicals, and some of the chemicals or excessive chemicals, may not serve them well and serve their grow well. Nice, really nice. You have a lot of knowledge. Uh, then, you think it's better a free... Mm, a free market or a free marijuana wall, or it's best be regulated? So I'll share my opinion on this. Everyone's going to have their own opinion. And I think it could go either way for me, honestly. I think personally, as a consumer, as a person, I want to grow whatever I want to grow. Okay. And I would love just to throw seeds in the ground, which actually in Colorado, I have the right to do that. I can grow plants anywhere in my yard, and it's just fine, you know, and I, and I will, and I do, <laughs> for sure. But I think there's something interesting to be said about regulation. And what we see, and I think this is just speculation, I'm kind of thinking out loud. I just saw the question earlier, and I hadn't really put that into words before I talked about this. With regulation comes legitimacy. And I think that's important for this industry. It's whatever, for laws. We think illegal things are not good for us. I think this is a mistake. And I think regulation will help turn the perception back in favor of reality for this crop in particular. I mean, we don't think corn's bad for us. I don't think cannabis is any worse for us than corn, as an example. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, I agree with you. Yes. 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 So, uh, you explained it really, really good, and I agree with you. So, I want to say one yeah. more thing about that. One thing that regulation also offers is people that supported cannabis under any condition, especially illegal conditions, where they actually put themselves at risk. And a lot of people have gone to jail, at least in Estados Unidos, for this plant. Mm -hmm. And still, it continues to be popular. Those people now have the opportunity to create a business and support their families, and actually to have a very nice living. And there's an industry that we can all get behind, that we've all been behind since, as you, as you probably know, the first time that you were in, introduced to this plant, and you're like, wow, and you've supported it ever since, or I have, since I was pretty young, and my brothers before me. But it was bad or wrong, so it was kind of, you know, hidden. Now we can not only embrace it, but we can support it. Not only for our personal use, but also for the benefits of what does this plant actually do? It's fun. We enjoy it. There's a lot of medicinal properties that we don't even, we haven't even begun to really understand. Also, there's food properties. The seed of cannabis has all the omega fatty acids that create a full protein, a plant-derived protein. And any huge agriculture company will let you know that plant-derived proteins are the most important thing that we're going to need for agriculture moving forward instead of livestock having alternate protein sources. And the stalks and fiber can feed us. So there's this plant that has a multi-purpose medicine, recreation, food, and fiber. There's nothing else on earth like it. That's important. And that does require regulation to harness and to develop. Nice, really nice. I, I think that also the regulation can give and support more the information, because uh, at least in Spain, it's a lot of mm, misunderstood about weed and, and all the, the effects and the uses that you can, you can have with it. So we going, going to ask, I'm going to ask you something more more about your job, so which kind of growing methods you, you use? For me, so I was more of a consumer than I was a grower. I'm a gardener, an avid gardener. My parents always gardened, and my brother is going, growing up in the 70s and the 80s. I would be a little kid, mm -hmm. and they'd go out of town, they'd have plants, I'd be like, Colin, don't <laughs> let these die. That's basically <laughs> what I said. They didn't give me any training. But in Colorado, starting to grow learning how to grow, most growers in Colorado use cocoa. I like to use peat, 
Mm -hmm. So pots, five gallon pots ultimately with peat and using straight up organic liquid fertilizers is how we're trained to use. You know, a little silica, a little mammoth peat, so I like to use the microbes and grow them up. I keep it very, very simple. You know, I've only had one or two light grows. Mm -hmm. And so I've only been only, honestly a novice grower. I'll say I've been to hundreds and hundreds of grows in, in the United States. And I've been in grows where there's multi hundred thousand square feet of canopy. It's incredible. It just goes forever. And <laughs> this is true. Every single grow I've ever been in is different. No one does it the same way. There's differences in every one. So there's, I don't think there's a wrong way. There's some optimal ways. And there's always opportunities to learn. There's not one professional or hobbyist grower that I've ever met that does things exactly the same way. And I think that's very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. And to finish this nice interview, which is your favorite strain? No. I like the fruity ones, okay. I like the OEGs, <laughs> yeah. and so what I do like and what I really appreciate, I've learned this, I used to grow a bunch of cheese and I've grown a lot of kush, but what I love is the real dank smell that translates to taste, and that's where, and some of my partners too, have allowed me to learn how to become more of a connoisseur when it comes to smoking. I don't, I don't really consume extracts, okay. I like to do a lot of tinctures with CBD, and I, I find that the tinctures that have the terpenes are the ones that affect me and help me, especially with CBD. I'm a huge advocate of CBD, and I have hemp farms back in Colorado, a 62-acre farm and several 5,000 square foot greenhouses. As a company, we do that. But as far as marijuana, uh, I like the taste. And so if it smells and you can get the taste, oh, that puts it all together. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's really nice talking with you, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Ganja buena, ganja santa, voy a la calada cada día para probarla. ¿Cuál es la ganja que manda? Levántame la mano si te gusta fumarla. Ganja buena, ganja santa, voy a la calada cada día para probarla. ¿Cuál es la ganja que manda? Levántame la mano si te gusta fumarla. Santi subida quelli que me piace de fumarla. Santi subida quelli que me piace cultivarla. Santi subida quelli que me piace de rollarla. No capisco cómo es Bisogna spacciarla Ogni giorno a Barcellona Tappa fissa alla calata Critica alle scanche O cush tutta la serata Qua a casa di Mattia Fuma toda la mañana E ogni giorno prego Che sia così pure in Italia Brrr Con ambush e fumo er babbona Brrr C'ho la calata solo er babbona Brrr Barcellona fuma er babbona Gancia garantita Dal controllo qualità Brrr Con ambush e fumo er babbona Brrr C'ho la calata solo er babbona Brrr Barcellona fuma er babbona Gancia garantita Dal Ganja buena, ganja santa, voy a la calada cada día para probarla. ¿Cuál es la ganja que manda? Levántame la mano si te gusta fumarla. Ganja buena, ganja santa, voy a la calada cada día para probarla. ¿Cuál es la ganja que manda? Levántame la mano si te gusta fumarla.